War II, Civil War, revolutions, China has gone through so much that affected the Chinese relationship with the US. And you portray a lot of this in your book, China 1945. If you could describe with one word where you see the relationship between the US and China going, what would that word be? It would be contradictory, I think. I can't think of a better word because because the, rela because the relationship contains many contradictions within itself. On the one hand, you have two countries with very different values and practices, but at the same time, uh, there are so many areas where we should be cooperating. The economic relationship is very important. We desperately need to cooperate with on uh, pollution and uh, uh, hydrocarbon emissions, global warming. Uh, we need to cooperate again in the war on terrorism. Uh, we have a lot of common interests, uh, these, our two countries. And so two things are, these two things are going to happen at the same time. There's going to be that cooperation and there's going to be the tension and conflict as well. Writer, journalist, and foreign correspondent for some of the biggest media outlets in the U.S. for over three decades, Richard Bernstein has had a long relationship with China. He spent the mid-80s as a China watcher between Hong Kong and Beijing. He wrote his first book in 1982, having China as his focus point. Ever since then, Richard wrote several books that showcased his interest in China. His latest, China 1945, America, Mao's Revolution, and the Turning Point in Asia, talks about dramatic events of 1945 that continue to shape the relationship between the U.S. and China. You wrote a lot of books about China or that had something to do with China, but as of recently, you were focusing more on young adults and young readers, correct? <laughs> Well, with one book, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I've never really focused on young mm -hmm. readers, but there was that one story, that was, um, my, yeah. the story of my wife, who was from yeah. China, uh, when she was 11 years old and went to the Beijing Dance Academy. So I took some time off to write Special a book, story, about, a book right? about her. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my main focus has really never been on young readers. Uh, what well, prompted uh, you to write China 1945, though? When I was in graduate school, <clears throat> um, I actually wrote a seminar paper on Chinese-American relations at that time, 1944, 1945, 1946, and the origins of Sino-American hostility. Mm -hmm. um, so when I finished my, my last book, uh, the book you just mentioned, yeah. um, I was looking for a new topic. Uh, and I had a conversation with my publisher. I wanted to do something on, on China and uh, China and the United States. And we decided that it would be a good idea to focus on one single year, that would, that, some kind of turning point seminal year, and uh, to use that year uh, as a microcosm for the, for the whole relationship. When <coughs> you think of 1945, I feel like most people at least think about the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a very significant factor as to why that's such an important year for China, for the US. But I feel like your book is more than that. It goes deeper into the source as to why that year generated such long animosity between the two countries. What are some things that stand out the most to you that generated that type of animosity? Well, the end of the war, is, it's, the, <clears throat> it's, the, it's the seven or eight months before the end of the war. Mm -hmm. In fact, the book really starts uh, in the fall of 1944, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it goes on until about March or April of 1946, so it's not just 1945. There's a little bit of a device in the idea of using that year, because I flash yeah. back, I flash forward. Um, it's an important year, though, right? But yeah, but the year itself um, was the main thing. The, the trajectory uh, uh, what is very clear. If you look at the very beginning of that year, January 1945, uh, the American relationship with the Chinese communists and, of course, with the Chinese nationalists was extremely good. Uh, there were representatives, American representatives, observers, 
in Yan'an, the Chinese headquarters in the northern Shanxi province, uh, where Mao and uh, Zhu De and the other leading Chinese communists uh, lived and built their movement. Uh, there was a lot of talk of cooperation. Chairman Mao was talking about the model, the great model of American democracy. Uh, Chinese uh, uh, soldiers that had infiltrated behind Japanese lines were rescuing American airmen that were shot down. Uh, so it was a very hopeful, good period. By the end of the year, and we're talking a few months after the end of World War II, but really almost within weeks of the actual end of the war, the relationship started to sour. And uh, it became clear that the Chinese communists didn't want the kind of cooperation with the United States that they had been speaking about earlier. Uh, the United States found itself, the momentum was pushing it to giving support to the Chinese nationalists as the recognized legitimate government of China. And that kind of inevitably put uh, the United States into conflict with the Chinese communists. And so the, the whole atmosphere changed during that uh, during that time. So it was very, really striking uh, difference, tri striking change that took place over those months. As you've mentioned, though, <clears throat> the U.S. and China have gotten warm several times mm -hmm. with the U.S. promising to modernize China, yeah. promising that money <laughs> and technology would bring China out of poverty. What do you think are some non-obvious factors that prevented that from happening? Well, um, a non-obvious factor. <laughs> uh, <that's laughs> uh, I think the main factor, let's leave aside whether it's mm -hmm. obvious or not obvious, um, was the importance of uh, Stalin, okay. uh, the Soviet leader, and the relationship between Stalin and Mao. Uh, the more I looked into this subject, uh, the more I came to feel that some of the conventional wisdom, some, some of the prevailing ideas uh, about Chinese-American relations at that time were, were wrong and needed to be retuned. Uh, and one of them, one of the ideas was that if the United States had only behaved somewhat differently, uh, that the outcome also could have been very different. If we had been friendlier to the Chinese communists, they would have been friendlier to us. I see almost no evidence for that. Uh, I think that uh, the facts on the ground uh, operated against uh, good relations between China and the United States. And the facts on the ground were, one, Mao and the nationalists were going to have yeah. a, an ultimate showdown, mm -hmm. a winner-take-all showdown once the Japanese had been defeated and kicked out of China. Two, uh, Mao was a, a revolutionary internationalist who recognized mm -hmm. Stalin as the supreme leader of the of the world revolution, and he was going to continue to um, be a loyal um, acolyte and a loyal follower of Stalin, which he was throughout the throughout the war and and before and after too. I mean, we all know, of course, that Mao started criticizing the Soviet Union yeah. in the late fifties and early sixties, but only after Stalin was dead. Up until the time of Stalin died, he never criticized the Soviet Union, even in the slightest bit. Um, so, I do think that it was mostly Mao's choice, Mao's character, and his allegiance to Stalin that made uh, antagonism between the United States and China inevitable. China 1945 brings many gigantic personalities, such as Mao, President Roosevelt, and General George Marshall to life, while examining some major immoral decisions from the American side. Stalin's ambitions and Mao's ideologies, allowing us to understand what determined the fate of the Cold War in Asia, and the details on how China went communist. When it comes to Chiang and the nationalists, and the American approach towards him, there is certainly a lot of inconsistencies, you know, one time praising him, another time criticizing him. Yeah. <coughs> Do you think that that changed the way things went in any way? Uh, 
Probably not in any fundamental way, no. Um, by 1945, uh, Jiang was going to lose China. Um, and I don't think that there's anything that the United States could have done short of sending in two million troops uh, to fight on Jiang's side. That was going to change the outcome. And there was no way politically that the United States was going to make a major investment, as it did later in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It chose not to do what it later did in Vietnam. It gave some help to the nationalists, but actually not all that much. And um, as some of the better China watchers on the United States side at the time were saying, the future of China is Mao, not, not Chiang Kai-shek. Mm -hmm. um, I do think one of the things, I, I have a, a moderately more sympathetic attitude towards Zhang than some previous writers on this subject have, have had. Um, I don't think that he's gotten as much credit as he deserves for <laughs> holding on for you know, eight long years of war against Japan, including four years without any friends or any allies whatsoever. I mean, I said the war started in full in 1937 with the Japanese invasion of North China and uh, Shanghai and the Yangtze River Valley. And the United States didn't get into the war until the end of 1941 after Pearl Harbor. So, uh, I mean, compared Chiang Kai-shek held on without surrendering for eight long years, compare that to the French <laughs> who held on for six long weeks <laughs> before surrendering and creating a Good collaborationist point. government uh, with the German invaders. And this is something that China under Chiang Kai-shek never did. Um, so on the one hand, we didn't give John credit for that. On the other hand, we were always pressing him to make the kinds of political reforms that were impossible for him to make without losing power at that time in China. And thirdly, we were complaining that he wasn't fighting against the Japanese when in fact he was fighting against the Japanese. I mean, the, the nationalists took more than a million military casualties during the course of those eight years, uh, many of them after the United States got into the war. In your opinion, was it ever rational to think that Stalin could change the fate of China in any way? Well, I think Stalin did change the fate of China in very important ways uh, by clandestinely carrying out policies that ensured the, the victory of the Chinese communists in the Civil War. Uh, it started, I mean, I, basically I think that once Stalin invaded, invaded Manchuria, Manchuria is not a small place. You know, Manchuria is the size of Germany, France, and Poland combined. It's an enormous territory and it you know, has a very, very long border. Uh, with other provinces in North China and something like 1,800 mile border with the Soviet Union itself. So once the Russians were in control of Manchuria, uh, which was in August 1945, promising that they would leave within three months, <clears throat> but in fact they stayed for a year, uh, it was, it, at that point it really became impossible for the nationalists ever to regain control of Manchuria and a great deal of North China. So that was a very that was decisive in my view uh, uh, for the outcome of uh, the, the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. The ironic thing is that that Roosevelt, the American president, mm -hmm. invited the Russians to yeah. invade Manchuria. Uh, he pleaded with them to invade Manchuria, and he agreed secretly, not informing the Chiang Kai-shek government, even though that was the government that both the Soviet Union yeah. and the United States recognized, not informing Chiang Kai-shek that in exchange for their invasion of Manchuria, he was going to agree to a set of neo-colonialist privileges, control over the port of Dalian, for example, the most important deep water port in Manchuria, a naval base in another port, Port Arthur, control of the South Manchurian Railroad, which was the most important artery of communications in, in Manchuria. Plus, he was going to strip Manchuria of all of its, of its industry. The United States agreed to all of that. Uh, and in exchange for, for what? For essentially giving Stalin Manchuria for free. <laughs> uh, and something that Stalin would have wanted anyway. Mm -hmm. He didn't need to be invited by the United States in order to <laughs> send his troops into, into Manchuria. Um, why did Roosevelt do that? Because at the time, we th he, he thought, uh, and most people thought that, in order to defeat Japan, there would have to be an invasion of Japan, which would be very, very costly. 
And so he wanted Russian participation in order to save the lives of American soldiers. The irony is that the invasion was never necessary because of the atom bomb, which was dropped three days, the first one was dropped three days before the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. Something I hear quite often is the speculation of who lost China. Yeah. Which to me personally, I think it collaborates, it helps build this American character that so many people around the world hate. You know, that superior type of attitude. Why do you think that people still think like that or still say things like that when China was never an American property to begin with? Right. It has to do with, um, I mean, look at it this way. The United States fought the war in the Pacific for the sake of China in order to expel the Japanese and to help um, bring about a, uh, a pro-Western, friendly to the United States, uh, and hopefully eventually democratic China. We had a long history of relations with China, the missionaries. Uh, we gave the boxer indemnity for Chinese students to come study in the United States. The United States had great hopes with China. It was the main objective of World War II, which was, of course, enormously costly to the United States. And then <coughs> within months, uh, and certainly within four years of the end of World War II, China has become an enemy country close to the Soviet Union. The situation was even worse than it had been at the, at the time of the Japanese invasion. So it was natural for the United States to wonder what went wrong. How did this China that we wanted for ourselves, how did we lose it to the communist sense of the Soviet Union? So that's where the, you know, this phrase, who lost China, uh, came about. But it's, it's absolutely true, we didn't lose China. It wasn't, it wasn't ours to lose. Through extensive research, Richard Bernstein looked back in history and saw many facts in the year of 1945 that can be valuable for people in the western side of the world. Many of his conclusions about the American influence in China are absolutely significant to those trying to take a deeper look into the current American involvement with Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance. Richard's engaging narrative shines a light on the era that led to many of today's trials, providing us with essential lessons about diplomacy. Why do you think it's important for the general public, for the American readers now, to learn about this type of history that is in 1945 in your oh, book? Such a good question. Nothing has been more important in the, to the United States since the end of World War II than its relationship with Asia. Uh, our efforts to shape an Asia according to our desires and our preferences and our interests has been the supreme challenge for the United States for these entire 70 years, and it will be exactly 70 years uh, starting in, in 2015. I mean, the, the battle the lost battle over China, then the Korean War, then the Vietnam War. Uh, and now look, uh, the, the, the wars in Afghanistan, the wars in Iraq. So this has been the preoccupation of the United States and we have not been successful. We've been successful in some respects. Mm -hmm. In many respects we've been successful. We've maintained the peace, uh, certainly since the end of the Vietnam War. Asia is a zone of prosperity. We have tremendous economic benefits with, uh, with Asia, including with China. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, it hasn't been a failure, but where it has been conflictual, where it has been a failure, it's been a very big one. 1945 is the opening, is the, the, the first chapter in this long saga of American relations with, uh, with Asia. And to know something about it, to know the, the choices that were made and the mistakes that were made, uh, I think it's very important to understand for the future of our relationships with Asia as well. I had never made that connection and I completely agree now that you pointed out so many different things and I feel like it's looking at the past that you can find solutions for the future a lot of times. Or at least you can help to avoid mistakes, um, uh, to understand what the forces might be and where you might be blindsided or you, or you may not understand. I mean the United States has this habit as the superpower 
as a relatively benign superpower in my view, uh, we do actually want to spread democratic values. It would be good if uh, we could be successful in this. But we enter into these situations in Asia that are difficult and mysterious to us. Uh, we don't really fully understand. That's one of the things that I try to do in this book is to try to show what, what did the Americans in Asia in China understand and what did they not understand about the situation. What they didn't understand was very important. And that's the same thing with the Middle East now. I'm sure there's so many things there that we just don't understand, we don't comprehend, and we probably won't for a long time, but. And we, you know, one thing that we, that we, we tend to attribute to other parties uh, characteristics that really belong to us. Uh, in fact, as I point out in the book, uh, when uh, the first mediation effort came along, it was led by a <coughs> very uh, interesting, uh, deeply flawed, uh, but in fact very dynamic uh, figure called Patrick J. Hurley. He's an mm -hmm. important character yeah. in this story. Um, he, wanted, he, he was absolutely confident. He was a, a very successful mediator in conflicts in the United States. And, and, and in fact, outside the United States, a uh, very successful corporate lawyer. And he thought, okay, he has the skill, he has the charm, he has the kind of the skills and the sense of humor to just settle this matter between Mao and Chiang Kai-shek. He can handle it. Uh, and so he blundered into China to try to do it. Um, one of the uh, more expert American diplomats uh, said that Hurley thinks that settling the conflict between the communists and the nationalists in China it would be like settling a conflict between Republicans and Democrats in the <laughs> United States. But it wasn't. The political culture was very, very different, and uh, it was not one that was amenable to an American-style solution. And Hurley, Hurley never accepted that. And in fact, Hurley was the one, uh, after we lost China, who began the search for who to blame for the loss of China, and he turned against these very, very brave, uh, very honest, and extremely intelligent uh, China watchers, China experts in the State Department, who had advised Hurley to do things differently. Do you plan in immersing into Chinese history, into more Chinese history in the future? Oh. Or is this the <laughs> last? One for a while. I haven't completely decided on my next project. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like very much uh, to find another a, a related subject. Uh, frankly, I haven't found it yet. But yeah, my interest in China and in the American relationship with China, and more broadly in the American relationship with uh, with Asian societies and with Asian culture is is enduring interest and I hope that I'll be able to find ways to pursue that interest in the future, sure. In a way, the CCP's efforts to portray itself as moderate and democratic recapitulated a famous episode from the past. During the first united front between 1923 and 1927, Stalin's plan, as he put it in a secret speech to party members, was for Zhang to be, quote, squeezed like a lemon and then thrown away, end quote. Zhang's preemptive strike against the communists in 1927 foiled that plan. Now, in 1945, the plan was operational again, and this time it was going to succeed. <laughs>